security, we really need to keep them closed. If you, uh, uh, if you would like to like, have a little bit more space or open area, uh, we can give you, actually, we can put some chairs for you out there. Or you can sit in that room, which I prefer to have it for the ladies who have small children. The meeting room, there are a lot of chairs in there. They can use the chairs, they can use whatever they want, and uh, keep the area here very quiet. We would love to see your children here. And I always say it was our mothers who brought us here, fathers and mothers brought us to these kind of gatherings. That's what, what we are today. So if, we, if you have a child you can't control, please, I'm going to get a couple of our ladies to go upstairs. And if you have really small babies, infants, and they may cry, or if they cry here, immediately please uh, take them to the, that room and quiet them down because I really hate to become I mean, disturbing you in there, coming, walking in, the, in, the, in your area. So if you, you do it yourself so we don't have to come in and help you with that. Uh, tomorrow we have, so uh, the doors please, they're going to be kept closed. And sorry for the inconvenience, you know, we have security guards out from this side. They're protecting you, alhamdulillah. And uh, we don't want to open the doors just for that, for right now. And tomorrow we have uh, the ladies' uh, majlis here that is led by our sister uh, Qazwini. Inshallah, it's going to be starting from, as usual, as last week, actually, last weekend, from 11 to 1 p.m. 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the youth were telling me that they have a youth uh, program, program of Q&A uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, right, Ali? Tomorrow. And if you have any question regarding that, our brother here, mashallah, this young good man, he's going to be giving you some information about that. Ali Daya, he's one of the best we have here, mashallah. He's going to give you some more information on that. And uh, the masks, uh, please observe, because you know we have to close these doors for Monday, which is uh, Ashura day. Uh, it's going to be very crowded. We might have to open the doors, and we are going to bring some security guards over there to guard us. And we probably, most probably, it's going to be probably you know, almost sure to uh, bring some carpets out there those of you who would like to sit in a fresh air, it's going to be there and we're going to you know, put a, a speaker over there for you. If you want to get a good spot in this room, you need to be here around 9.30 or maybe before that. So uh, having that said, and our programs are continued, inshallah, till the coming Tuesday, Tuesday night. Muharram day, our program is going to start 10 a.m., and we'll end by the uh, Dhor and Asr prayer. And food will be served. Uh, and we have the same day, actually Monday, we have at night time we have a program. Tuesday night we have a program. It's going to be the end of our program for Muharram this year. Salah ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. For those of you who would like to follow with me the recitation of the Holy Quran, I'm going to be reciting Surah Al Hadid uh, from ayah number 17, maybe four or five small ayahs, inshallah. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim 
Beautiful ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran 
It says that people be aware that it is us or know that it is us who revive the land after his death. And it goes to the people who give, the people who donate, the people who do sadaqat, give sadaqat, the people who help others. From men and women, musaddiqeen wal musaddiqat. And those who give, uh, the lend people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for them, there is the best rewards. Ajrun Kareem. And those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet, and they are going to be Siddiqun, the, the people who are in the, the right path at all times. Was Shuhada, uh, the martyrs, they have a great reward in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a great position with them. And here, the most important, actually, I use this two, three verses before to get to this part of this. Because this is uh, directly related to our life in today's time. And every time, of course, but today's time is even more uh, it's emphasized on this. It says, Know that the life of this world is just la'adun wa lah, just ornaments and uh, games and play. Wazina wa tafakhur. Zina, the, you know, the ornaments and tafakhur, like uh, boasting, I think it's called, yeah, between each other. And, uh, and getting more or working for more wealth and children. And it gives an uh, uh, example, it says, it's just like when the rain comes and it grows the produce or the plants and then later on you see it dries out and goes in the air. These things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we need to be careful of in order to lead a good life what we need to do is to make sure that this material world is not going to catch us. The material world. If we got uh, in it too much, it's going to take us from our reality, our personality, our, uh, just our soul pretty much. And Allah at the end says, uh, race for sabiqu ila maghfiratim min rabbikum. Race for forgiveness from your Lord. So you can achieve what? Jannatun arduha samawati wal ard. Arduha ka ardi samai wal ard in this verse. It's just the width of, of the Jannah, one of them, is as big as the whole earth and the whole sky or the whole heavens which is prepared already by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messengers sallallahu alaihi muhammad wa ali muhammad tonight we are going to have another uh, one of our youth uh, to be talking to us uh, mr ihsan raza Barnus, is he here? Okay, please come on over. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem. Bismillahi rahmani rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, today I've come to you to speak of Abu Fadl Abbas alayhi salam. And I'd like to open uh, with a poem dedicated to him. The words I tried to write about your absence felt so in incomplete. And so the lines were but stains of ink with no soul nor light. For when your joyful heart refused to beat, mine laid down its pen and ceased to write. Now here I am writing about a poem that was never decreed. 
a wordless poem guided by grief and veiled in my heart that never saw light? And is there a gain to my silence? My love for you is something that poetry fails to express and my lips fail to speak. Every tongue said that this life would turn you to a soul that is cold and one that would be unable to smile or love again. And against their claims that only wanted to keep you from being whole, you were forged by this very life into a flower that left no heart sane. O oh, he who watched over as the champions of Karbala fell, he who ached for Hussein a pain which you could not spell. For the brave companions couldn't quell the thousands that stood with the devil's smell. One after another, he watched them go. One by one, their blood would flow. Flow onto the sands of Karbala and stain. Flow into the hearts of believers and gain. One man was left. There was one man, just one. One that was greater than any son. One that could be defeated by none. One that could take down the world and then some. There is one, there is Abbas. Salawat. Now, I wanted to talk about Abbas today because, you know, he was truly the epitome of loyalty and brotherhood. During the last stand of Karbala, we see the way in which he cared for the women and children in a time which they needed him most. Uh, this was best seen at the time in which he was asked by Hussein to get water for them, despite the fact that he considered Abbas to be his right-hand man, his standard bearer, his closest companion on the day in which he had no helping hand. Abbas was killed on his way back from the river, and with his fall, Hussein spoke of how his back had been broken by the loss of his brother. Up until his last moments, Abbas maintained his loyalty towards his brother, but more importantly, towards fighting against tyranny and oppression. As we all know, Abbas was buried in Karbala alongside Hussein, and 1,400 years after his passing, he's still considered to be the greatest of supporters, the strongest of soldiers, and the most virtuous of characters. Today, Abbas is revered by millions around the world, and um, sorry, uh, <laughs> seen as a hero figure representing courage and loyalty. To the Muslims, Abbas is known in many different ways as the Lion of Ali, the hero of Karbala, the flag bearer of Hussein, the beloved brother of Zainab, and the caring uncle of Sakina, peace be upon them all. When thinking of the flag bearer of Karbala, Abu Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, one thinks of heroism, bravery, dedication, altruism, and many more beautiful attributes. He was the younger brother of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and was known amongst the people as the moon of Bani Hashim, the tribe of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The devotion of Abbas to Hussein was not just on the physical level, it was also based on the spiritual level. This is reflected in his statement to Shimmer, one of the commanders of the Yazidi forces, who was actually related to Abbas through his mother, who was from the Kilabiya tribe, uh, while uh, Hussein's mother was the daughter of the Prophet, as we all know. Shimmer had come to Karbala with an aman, an assurance of protection or amnesty signed by Iraq's governor for Abbas and his three full brothers. When Shimmer presented that amnesty to Abbas, Abbas responded by saying, may God curse you on your amnesty. You give us assurance of protection, but the son of the prophet's daughter has no amnesty? Abbas bin Ali's message to us is quite clear. We have to strengthen the ties of brotherhood with fellow Muslims and non-Muslims alike, irrespective of their race, color, language, or geographical location. All of us are brethren in faith. All other relationships must be synchronized with that. We should be able to feel the pain of one another. As the Prophet Muhammad once said, Muslims are like one body. When one limb is injured, the hurt is felt by the entire body. Between Abbas and Imam Hussein, this level of closeness and concern is symbolized in the words of Hussein. When he heard Abbas calling for help as he was falling down from the horse, the Imam felt the pain and said, now my back has been broken and my options are few. Now I must ask, what is courage? In Islamic ethics, courage is actually not defined by physical strength. Uh, courage means to have control over one's emotions and feelings and to use them only for the right cause. A person who only relies on his physical strength and cannot control his emotions is not a courageous person 
he is rather a foolhardy person. While describing the Prophet and his true followers, Allah says in Surah Al-Fath, verse 29, Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are firm against the enemies, but soft with their own. Now Abbas was not the slave of his desires or emotions. Even his courage was linked to the spiritual relationship. Abbas was very stern and firm when he confronted the enemies, but he was very kind, compassionate, and caring towards the good people. The children of Hussein and the clan of Banu Hashim adored him. After all, he was the favorite uncle of Sakina, the four years old daughter of Imam Hussein. Unfortunately, what we see in the world today is that the tyrants, the kings, the generals who rule over Muslim countries behave in the opposite manner. They are humble in front of the enemies, but very bold when they deal with their own. And they oppress their own people. When Imam Hussein asked the boss to try and get water for the children, the boss confronted the enemy force and he was very easily able to disperse them, very easily able to get access to the water. Abbas entered the river, filled the water bag with water, and on the way back he had to pass through some palm trees where the enemy was of course hiding behind, waiting to hit him from the back. One Yazidi soldier attacked him from behind in such a way that he lost his right hand, but Abbas courageously got hold of the water bag and consoled himself by the following verses. By God, though you have severed my right hand, my faith I will surely forever defend. I will defend the truthful leader of conviction the grandson of the pure and truthful prophet. And we can see that loyalty is a very important quality, especially the loyalty towards one's faith and community. Abbas's loyalty has become proverbial in the literature of Karbala. On the eve of Ashura, when Imam Hussein asked his friends and family members to go away, to leave him, since the enemies were after his blood only, the first person to stand up and express his loyalty was Abbas bin Ali. He said, and why should we abandon you so we may live after you? May God not show us such a day ever. And finally, on the day of Ashura, when Imam Hussein asked him to get water for the children, he very easily succeeded in gaining access to the stream. He galloped into the stream, got down, filled the water bag. And as a person who had been thirsty for three days, Abbas could have very well quenched his thirst, but he did not do so. Legally as well as morally, nothing prevented him from quenching his thirst there. But he did not do so. It was his sense of loyalty to Hussein and the love for Hussein's children that prevented Abbas from drinking the water. While filling the water, he recited the following verses. While Hussein is drinking the syrup of death, you are imbibing the coolness of joy. Now the holding of standards in wars is the most significant position in armies. Standards are given exclusively to the soldiers who enjoy special military abilities. During the Battle of Attaf, the standard was in the hand of Abu Fadl al-Abbas, who preserved and held it from the beginning of the tragic journey from Medina to up to the last spark of his life. Al-Abbas protected that standard so bravely and uniquely that he embraced it to his chest when his two hands were severed. In more than one situation, Al-Abbas asked his brother Imam al Hussein for permission for fighting, but the Imam used to say to him, you are the standard bearer of my army. If you are martyred, my troops will separate. It's also well known that standard bearers are chosen according to special qualifications. The standard bearer must be accepted by everybody and must bear qualities such as courage, chivalry, and honor. The standard bearers must also exert all efforts to keep the standard high. For this reason, Al Abbas exerted unique efforts for keeping the standard high. When his right hand was severed, he held the standard in the left, and this one was also severed. He embraced the standard to his chest and held onto it until the last breath of his life. This is why he was given the title of Hamal al Liwa, which means the standard bearer. Now, when you look at the flag of Abbas, let it serve as a reminder of his loyalty to Hussein and his children. That flag challenges us to be loyal and true to our faith in all of its values. It urges the followers of Abbas to stand up against oppression, tyranny, injustice, in whatever shape or form that we see in our own times, all in the name of Allah and to serve the cause of Allah. Now, I must leave you with this mantra, which I hope we can all incorporate into our lives in order to do better. We shall die in truth, but never betray. We shall fulfill our promise and defend this flag. 
For love we live and for truth we die. Give not our hand in falsehood, but look to Hussein, who gave his head for defending truth. Salawat. kindly request my dear brothers to please move forward so we make room for those who are entering. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. The second salawat for the love of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا شهيد كربلاء فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the compassionate, the merciful. The one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His pure and beloved Messenger, the peak of His creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi And His immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajah. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states in the Holy Quran in Surah Ibrahim verse 10, قَالَتْ رُسُلُهُمْ أَفِ اللَّهِ شَكٌ the messengers said to their people, is there any doubt about the existence of Allah, the one who created the universe, the earth and the heavens? Sadaqallahu al-Aliyyul Azim. Illuminate your heart and mind with a very loud salawat. Indeed, there is nothing clearer than the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, than the existence of a creator who infused us with life. Yet, there are people who are struggling with this belief. Today, more and more people, many of our youth, are struggling with the belief in the existence of God. Just like a fish that is surrounded by all that water, and many times you think, right, the fish does not even know what the water is. It's surrounded with all that seawater. But if it does not leave that water to experience what's out there, it may not know what water is. We are drowned with the signs of God, with the effects of the existence of God. But sometimes some people may struggle with this belief. With all these misconceptions out there, how do I really know I have a creator 
who created me. And even more than that, how do I know that creator is the God that the Quran talks about? This may be just a claim. Okay, we know we have a creator. But who said it's the creator that the Holy Quran talks about? It's the creator who has these names in the Quran, the 99 names, or the attributes that the Holy Quran gives us. I want to achieve certainty that this is the Lord that I'm worshiping through logic. Through my intellect, I want to experience my Lord. That's the message of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He sacrificed for Allah. He sacrificed to awaken us to our Creator. It is very important for us in this era to be very strong in our beliefs, my dear brothers and sisters. We have to articulate our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our families, our children, You'd be surprised how many people are doubting the existence of God. Many youth come to me. They privately tell me, say it, I'm struggling. I don't even know what to believe in anymore. I don't even know if I really have a creator. I don't even know if there is Allah. It is through these majalis of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam that we develop yaqeen and certainty in our creator. And trust me, believe me, when you find yaqeen in God, everything else falls into place. Sometimes you feel like your life is falling apart. Nothing makes sense around you. The belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grounds you. The belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you with peace, serenity. Therefore, it's very important that we have this discussion. How can we truly come to know about the existence of our Lord beyond any doubt, with full certainty? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not left us without a built-in compass that takes us to Him. This is what Islam calls the fitrah. Do you know today scientists are confirming that our brains are programmed and wired to believe in God? Atheists are saying that. Evolutionary scientists who reject God, they're admitting, they're confused. They're like, we don't understand why the human brain is programmed to believe in a supernatural power, in some higher being, in some God. We don't understand why. But our brain is programmed to believe in the existence of God. That's the fitra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled in us. One very interesting experiment conducted by the University of Helsinki in Finland, it demonstrated this fitra. They brought a group of hardcore atheists. Now there are soft atheists and you've got those tough aggressive atheists. The soft atheist says, okay, I don't really believe in God, but maybe he exists, maybe, I don't know. The, the aggressive atheist is the one who says, no, 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 God does not exist for sure. God is a fairy tale. That's what they're saying to these children. Some teachers, this is what they're teaching children. I'm sure 100% there is no God. These are the aggressive atheists. So they got a group of these aggressive atheists. And they wanted to experiment and see how they react. So they put this device, these electrodes, on their fingers, two of their fingers, to sense their emotions. Because when you're in a state of fear, for instance, when the emotion of fear kicks in, your body releases certain hormones. So you can actually detect that. That's why they have lie detectors, right? Sometimes they can detect whether you're lying or not based on how your body responds and how your body reacts. So they got this group of atheists. They put this device on their hand and they told them, we're gonna say the following, let's see your reaction. They said to the atheists, we are going to make the statement and ask you to repeat it. They're like, okay, go ahead. So they told them, make this prayer. I challenge this rock over here to kill my parents. They started laughing. This rock over here can't do anything to my parents. I challenge this rock to kill my parents. 
They mocked the idea. They're like, you're sure that the rock can't hurt your parents? Like, of course. Of course the rock. What is the rock going to do to my parents? Challenge the rock to kill your friends. To hurt your friends. They said, I challenge this rock to hurt my friends. They said it laughing. After they said that, they told them, okay, are you sure God does not exist? We're sure, 100% God does not exist. Okay, now challenge God. Say, I challenge God to hurt me and to hurt my parents. Guess what happened? Fear kicked in their bodies. They could detect the fear using these devices. Say it. Many of them struggled to say it. I thought God was just a fairy tale, just like this rock. What's the difference between them? How come you're not able to say it? They concluded that there is something built inside the human being, in your psychology, in your brain, that connects you with the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the beautiful fitrah. That's the beautiful fitrah. My dear brothers and sisters, these days we need to reflect. We want signs to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Science, and we keep saying this over and over again, science is the best ally to religion. Science does not contradict religion. I challenge anyone to bring any belief system that we have based on solid Quran, and the Ahlul Bayt alayhimussalam. And tell me that this defies science. Everything we believe in is confirmed by research. It's confirmed by science. You just have to know how to analyze the world around you. Islam tells you singing and all these types of haram music is not good for you. It's haram. Stay away from it. It will bring you poverty, spiritual poverty. Some people make fun of this. Like a young man who once made fun of this. Like say, do you really believe in this stuff, in these hadiths? Told him, Astaghfirullah, what do you mean? This is the word of Amir al Mu'mineen. He says, prolonged exposure to music and singing, yurithun faqr. It brings you spiritual poverty. Now, the Imam doesn't say spiritual poverty, he says poverty. But I told him, you have to understand what Amir al Mu'mineen is talking about. He's like, Sayyid, the singers, musicians, they're the richest people on earth. They're famous and rich. What do you mean poverty? What kind of poverty? I told him, look at the research out there. One of the highest rates of suicide, one of the highest rates of depression, one of the highest rates of anxiety are amongst two. This is official research, official statistics amongst the musicians and the singers. In the UK, as an example, 19% of the average population, they suffer from depression, which is a lot. That's one out of every five Briton. But then they looked at subcategories, doctors, engineers, lawyers, teachers, and then they looked at musicians and singers. Guess what the figure was for musicians and singers? The figure was at 68% in this study. 68% of all musicians and singers in the UK, they suffer from depression and they have one of the highest rates of suicide. Why? Explain that to me. Money, they have all the money that you can dream of. Fame and reputation, look at the millions of followers that they have. They have the spotlight, they have fame. What do you want? People kill themselves just to reach that status. But they're not happy. Poverty. The imam says poverty. You live your life in this world distracting yourself from your Lord, from everything around you. You will not be happy. So when Islam tells you about something, it's confirmed by science. Science has told us that you have pre- Adamite human beings, meaning you've had human-like figures for hundreds of thousands of years. I know some people, they started to struggle with their faith. Oh, this contradicts the Qur'an. I know a brother who left the religion of Islam because he told me, yeah, the Qur'an tells us that human beings are very recent in the last few thousand years. And science has shown that no human-like figures have existed for hundreds of thousands of years. I told him, excuse me, who told you the Qur'an said that? Who told you this is the position of Islam? Islam in fact has confirmed to us that before Adam alayhi salam, there were many Adams. In one beautiful hadith, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam, once he told one of his companions, you think you're the only humans God ever created? The Imam says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has divided the era of human beings into seven eras. 
You are in the last of those eras. You're in the seventh round. There were six rounds before you, before Adam alayhi salam. This is confirmed by science. Every single aspect of our religion, of our belief system, it's confirmed by science. By science. Even the way we sleep, my dear brothers and sisters, even the way we sleep. Islam tells you it's mustahab. It's recommended to sleep on your side. One day I was wondering, is there any scientific basis behind this? Subhanallah, I read an article that tells you sleeping on your side is the best position to sleep. It aids with your digestion. Your salah is backed up by science. Your sujood is backed up by science. When you go into the state of sujood and your brain is lower than your heart, which is the only natural position to do that, right? And you have the heart pumping blood directly to your brain. Do you know what wonders does that for your brain? Doctors have said this is a very good position for the human being. It allows you to de-stress. And then one of the beautiful aspects of our school of thought is that we have to prostrate on the ground, right? In order for your sujood, for your prostration to be valid, you prostrate on the ground, on the earth, or that which grows from the earth, but it's not edible or eaten. There's science behind this too. I invite you all to read about the science of grounding. You know, one of the problems of our modern lifestyles, we barely touch the ground. Do you know how much positive energy there is in the ground? When you touch the ground, the dust of the earth, that positive energy is transferred to your body. It's called grounding. It helps with inflammation. It helps with cancer. It helps with your psychology. It's so helpful. Allah wants you to prostrate like that. That's beautiful. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is called Abu Turab, the father of dust. That's beautiful. That's backed up by science. These days we live in buildings. Believe me, sometimes weeks pass by, we don't really touch the earth. That's why we have all these problems, all these sicknesses, all these diseases. The earth has the power to heal you. And it is through salah that sometimes at least you're able to ground yourself and benefit from all these positive charges. Your fasting is backed up by science. Every aspect of our religion is backed up by science, my dear brothers and sisters. So let's examine how we can use logic, how we can use science in order to see closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, one very important way for us to prove the existence of God, not that God needs His existence to be proven, but for us to see the existence of Allah. Because you know what Imam al Hussein salam says in Dua Arafah? He has such a beautiful statement. He says, Ilahi, mata ghibta anna, hatta tahtaja ila dalilun yadullu alayk. These are the words of Abba Abdullah. He says, Oh Allah, when were you ever absent for us to need to prove your existence? Look at the words of Sayyid al Shuhada alayhi salam. But we want to see these signs. In order for me to be confident and sure that I have a creator, I need to prove that this universe has a beginning. If we can prove that this universe has a beginning, we can prove it needs a creator. So how do we prove that this universe has an origin, has a beginning? There are many scientific ways for us to prove that, my dear brothers and sisters. One of them is called the law of entropy. It's a very interesting one. The law of entropy tells you when you look at this universe, you see everything going from disequilibrium to equilibrium. Now what does that mean in simple terms? When you take an ice cube and you put it in water, what happens to the ice cube? Why does it melt? Scientifically, why does it melt? Because of the law of entropy. Because the law of entropy tells you everything in the universe seeks to establish equilibrium. The ice cube melts so that it has the same energy with the water. The energy gets evenly dispersed in the cup. That's why it melts. Everything in the universe goes from disequilibrium to equilibrium. 
This law tells us the universe must have a starting point. Because today, my dear brothers and sisters, some atheists are trying to deny that. They're saying, who said this universe has a starting point? Maybe this has been going on for eternity. For infinity, you get a big bang and then you get a black hole, you get a big bang, whatever. We don't need a starting point. The law of entropy tells you, no, you need to have a starting point. Because if the universe was infinitely there, today you would not see any movement in the universe. Because everything must go from disequilibrium to equilibrium. So energy around the universe must be equal. But when we look at the universe today, we don't see equal energy. You see objects moving. You see big planets, smaller planets. That in itself tells you the universe must have a beginning. And when you know that the universe must have a beginning, that itself takes you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam al-Sadiq uses a variation of this principle. And when you read the hadith of the Imam alayhi salam, it's so simple from the outside. But subhanAllah, it's a reference to science. Specifically, the second law of thermodynamics. Listen to this hadith. The Imam was asked, prove to me the existence of God. The Imam, you know what he said? He said, when I look at the ceiling and it falls, the roof of the house, it falls, I know there's a creator. Analyze this statement. It's a very simple one. It's fascinating. What is the Imam telling us here? The Imam says, when you see a ceiling fall, crumble, a wall falling, you know you have a creator. Why? Because when you see a ceiling that falls, you know that someone put it together. Something is holding it in place. That's why it fell. It was organized, now it became disorganized. Look at the universe. Everything in the universe is going towards disorganization. Everything. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything goes towards disorganization. Nothing organizes itself. Have you ever seen something organizing itself? For instance, take these two examples. If you have a lot of, you know, cords and wires in your office, in your room, every once in a while you notice they get tangled up, right? They get disorganized. Have you ever come to your office and you see all these wires magically getting untangled? Has that ever happened? Or for those sisters, you know, who are jewelry, the gold chain, you know, one of the biggest problems with those is every few... Days you have to open a knot, right? Because they're so fine, those golden chains are fine. You have to open the knot and sometimes it becomes difficult. Sisters, have you ever seen these knots randomly just opening? That doesn't happen. Why? Because everything in the universe is going to disorganization. But when I look at this universe, I see it organized. It's functional. I know it must have a creator who's putting everything into its place. That's the meaning of the hadith of the Imam alayhi salam. So I know that this universe, all these multiverses, even if we assume we have multiverses, because the universe is moving and expanding, I know it has a starting point. So I ask this question. Now we're trying to discover the identity of this creator. Who is this creator? Intellectually, I want to know. By the law of intellect, I know whatever that external factor is, that generated this universe cannot be a physical entity, cannot be made up of matter. Because if it's made up of matter, it also needs something to put it into existence. And you cannot have an infinite chain. So I know it's above space and above time. Whatever that is, it must be outside of this universe. It's above space, it's above time. Time and space don't impact it. This is by the law of logic. That's the first thing I discover. What's the second thing that you discover? The second thing that you discover about this creator is that this creator must have power. If you can generate the Big Bang with all that energy, you must be powerful, whoever you are. And number three, whoever that creator is must have knowledge. Must know how to design things. Knows how to design an atom that functions. Knows how to design elements. My dear brothers and sisters, that being, which is above space and time, which is powerful, which is knowledgeable, what do we call that being? That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Quran tells you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is qadiran alim, 
The Quran is telling you that God, which you know through your intellect exists, is the Lord of the Quran. And all of the attributes in the Holy Quran and the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of those attributes, all of those names, we can intellectually arrive at them. Because now someone will ask, okay, I understand God exists. How can I benefit from this Lord? How can I develop an intimate relationship? You want to live in the presence of Allah and feel the presence of Allah? My dear brothers and sisters, live with the names of Allah. You know the 99 beautiful names? Or all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All these names are a reflection of the Almighty God. And every one of those names is helpful for you in any situation you go through throughout your life. For instance, if you're ever feeling depressed, mention this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, Ya Basit. What does Basit mean? Oh, expander. Or Ya Musa. Oh, the one who expands. Say this 10 times, my dear brothers and sisters, and see how Allah expands your chest. Because you are thinking with yourself, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expanded this entire universe, He cannot expand my chest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot help me. Live with the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I've committed a sin and I'm about to lose hope, say, Ya Ghaffar, O one who forgives. If I want to be enriched, I'm struggling. Say, Ya Razzaq, Ya Ghani, Ya Mughni. These are beautiful names of Allah for every situation that you go through. Someone has hurt you and you're destroyed. Ya Muntaqim. Oh Allah, you seek revenge however you see fit. You protect me from those evil people out there. For every situation, there's a beautiful name by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that reflects His power and knowledge. And all these names, we can logically prove them. Because when you say muntaqim, muntaqim the avenger, right? The one who seeks revenge. What does that mean? It means Allah uses His power to discipline someone. It goes back to power. It's just another name for power. When you say Ya Razak, what does it mean? Allah uses His power to give you sustenance. It all goes back to His power and His knowledge. All these names of Allah, you can intellectually prove them. And that's how we know the Lord who created us is the Lord of the Qur'an. Beyond any doubts, my dear brothers and sisters, live with the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Baqi, oh the one who stays. Everything will go, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will stay. These names are beautiful. They revive the heart. They allow you to see the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somebody broke your heart? Which name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you healing? Habib, you know, the name Habib, beloved, is one of the names of Allah. In Dua al Joshan, what do you all read in the month of Ramadan? Ya Habib, man la Habib. Oh, the Habib of the one who has no Habib. People will break your heart. These days a lot of our teenagers, they're deceived by teenage love. Your boyfriend will break your heart. Make no mistake. You think he really cares? He's just experimenting. Your girlfriend will break your heart. The only being who will not break your heart, if you know who he is, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Habib ban la Habib. The only love that never will put you in pain. And if you want evidence of that, look at Lady Zainab. Have you seen a woman who's broken like she's broken? She's lost her sons. She's lost her brother, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. She's lost the moon of the Hashimis, Abu al Fadl al Abbas. And when Ibn Ziyad, this evil, accursed enemy of God, he wants to add insult to her injury and put her through pain. And he tells her, Zainab, how do you find what God did to your brother Hussein? Didn't you see how God killed him? How do you find it? What does she say? Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. See, Zainab is in love with Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not break her heart. She sees his system as being a beautiful system. She's in pain. 
She's crying over what happened. It's a severe tragedy. But Zainab is at peace with her Lord. She's at peace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. When your boyfriend breaks your heart, you also, you, can you also say that? Seriously? Can you? Ma ra'aytu illa jameela? Huh? Unless the person has become insane. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can say that. Because Allah has a system. There's wisdom in the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your lover may be taking advantage of you, may be exploiting you, may be using you. But Allah is your Lord, your source of inspiration, your source of support. It's through these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what Tawheed is, my dear brothers and sisters. Why does Islam and every monotheistic religion stress on Tawheed? In one beautiful hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam, Ya Musa, if you put the seven heavens and their inhabitants, and you put the earth and its inhabitants on one side, and you put La ilaha illallah on the other side, La ilaha illallah will be heavier. That's the reality of Tawheed. Even, even the way La ilaha illallah is pronounced, it's fascinating, subhanAllah. You know, when you say La ilaha illallah, you speak from your heart. Because we have different types of letters, right? Some letters you utter them with your mouth, with your lips, like M. Some of them you utter them with your tongue, like the L, right? And then there are some letters that you utter from your throat. When you say La ilaha illallah, you're speaking from your heart. Because Allah is training you even the way you say this word. It, if it comes from your heart, it will do wonders in your life. And La ilaha illallah is one of those words that you don't even need to use your lips. You can close your mouth and you can say La ilaha illallah with your tongue. That's the beauty of this statement. That's why Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, states, according to a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> the Imam Ali السلام, states, the one who says la ilaha illallah yamuddu sawta. The Imam says, if you say la ilaha illallah and you stretch your voice, Meaning, you say it from your heart. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. See, right now, right now, I asked you to do salawat, right? And you all did salawat. But now, let's do this experiment. Close your eyes. Think of the beauty of God and that which, is he, that which He has created. Think of those NASA pictures. And then think of Al Muhammad and their sacrifice. And then now from your heart, thank Allah and Al Muhammad and now say the salawat. <laughs> Did you notice a difference? What's the difference? The salawat is the same salawat. You said the same words. Okay, part of it is louder. But what else did you notice? It came from your heart, the second one, right? More than the, not that the first one didn't come from your heart. It came from your heart. But the second one came deeper from your heart. Why? My dear brothers and sisters, if you say la ilaha illallah, if you pray, if you say the dhikr, just the way that you said the second salawat, you will be okay. Sometimes we say the dhikr, we don't even mean it. It doesn't come from the heart. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, states, when you say la ilaha illallah, and it comes from the heart, every sin that's on you will drop. That's the power of Tawheed. That's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's truly through these names of God that we feel the presence of Allah. So yes, intellectually we know God exists. But my dear brothers and sisters, live with the beautiful names of God. They will be the medicine for every situation that you're going through. But then, that's the first part of the equation. But now we also have a second part. And this is why we gather on these nights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a path to go to Him. 
Yes, He's the Creator. I don't need anyone to worship Allah. Yes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has dictated to us that if you want to worship me the way I want, you come through Muhammad and Al Muhammad. There are people today, my dear brothers and sisters, who struggle with this idea. Why? This is shirk. Why do you have to go through the Ahlul Bayt to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we respond to that? This is important. If you go through the gate of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam knowing what they have taught, your love for Allah deepens. You will worship God the way He wants. If someone challenges you, why do you believe in shafa'a, in intercession? Why do you say the Ahlul Bayt are the gates to God? Why do you say the Imam of your time is the gate to God? Isn't this exaggeration? Isn't this ghulu? Isn't this kufr shirk? We constantly hear that. From many people, even our youth are asking these days. If someone asks you this question, there's a short answer and there's a longer answer. But always analyze the short answers. They're beautiful. They're to the point and they truly remove the misconception. If someone asks you why do you mention the names of Ahlul Bayt? Bil Hussein, Bihaqi Muhammadin, Bihaqi Ali. Why? Why do you do that? Has God authorized that? My dear brothers and sisters, tell them the following. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to speak to us through this book, how did He speak to us? Through who did He speak to us? Through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa right? Why? Does God need the Prophet? God could have directly spoken to each one of us here. What, God doesn't have the power? Isn't He ala kulli shay'in qadir? Of course He can. Why did God use this messenger, this vehicle? This means, why? My dear brothers and sisters, if Allah chose Muhammad and Al-Muhammad to speak to me, I better use them to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a king sends you a messenger and he has a statement to you, you better use that same messenger if you have a letter back to that king. That's the short answer. Allah used them to communicate his message to us because he wants us to worship him according to their teachings. That's the beauty of the path of Ahlul Bayt. That's the beauty of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. And if anyone struggles with that, share with them how humanity started. This modern human being, how he started. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to create a Khalifa on earth, a human being, what did he command the angels to do? What did he command them to do? To do sujood? Sujood to who? To who? Adam, astaghfirullah. What do you mean to Adam? Sujood to who? No, the Quran doesn't say to Allah, you're right. The Quran says, Usjudu li Adam. Astaghfirullah, is that, is that shirk? Believe me, most people, most Muslims have not understood the Quran. They reread the Quran, we don't understand it. Allah starts humanity and khilafah and prophethood and the representation of God on earth by commanding the best and the best of his creation to do sujood to Adam. Now they weren't worshipping Adam. The worship was for Allah, but the gate was Adam. The qibla, the direction was Adam. This is the first lesson that the Holy Quran gives us. And the only one, the one, the only one who refused is who? Shaitan is like, no God, why? Why do you want me to do sujood to this blob of clay here? I can worship you in a better way. You know, in, in modern terms, he was the Wahhabi there. Allah, there's a shirk, I don't want this, give me another way. He refused, yeah. He refused, he literally says, that's not how you're worshipped. I don't want to go through this guy, who's, who's Adam? I've been around longer than he has been. Why do I, why do I now need to do sujood to Adam? That was his mentality. Allah says, Iblis, worship me the way I want. Not the way that you want to dictate. From day one, that's how it started, my dear brothers and sisters. Allah has assigned the Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt because he endowed them with the full intellect. Now it becomes clear, even the hadith that we have. I know some people struggle with hadith al-Kisa. Right? Hadith al-Kisa. إِنِّي مَا خَلَقْتُ سَمَاءً مَبْنِيَ وَلَا أَرْضًا مَدْحِيَ وَلَا إِلَّا لِأَجْلِكُمْ وَمَحَبَّتِكُمْ I hear some brothers, they don't read this dua. 
Habibi, this is a blessed hadith from Lady Fatima alayhi salam. Why don't you read hadith al-Kasaf? Say it. It, it encroaches, it approaches shirk levels, according to one very smart young man. It approaches shirk levels. <laughs> and there's ghulu and exaggeration in it. I'm like, what is the exaggeration in it exactly? He says, it says Allah created this universe for the Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet and his family. Come on, that's too much. I told him, why did God create us? You tell me. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah created us to worship him. I told him, did anyone in history worship Allah better than Muhammad and Al-Muhammad? Today, my dear brothers and sisters, today on earth, who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a hundred percent? The way that Allah wants, who? He must be with the Qur'an, whoever he is, because the Prophet says, after me, Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt, they shall never separate. The Qur'an is infallible, it's error free. So whoever is connected to the Qur'an must be infallible, must be error free. I ask today, who is that person? from the family of Ahlul Bayt who's connected to the Qur'an. Because the Prophet said, until the day of judgment, they shall never separate. Who is that? That's the Imam of your time who worships Allah 100%. Yes, the universe is created for them. Because they are the true worshipers. They have the full intellect and Allah created the universe for the intellect. And sometimes we human beings, we underestimate ourselves. Recently, a sister, after seeing those pictures that were released by NASA, you know, those magnificent pictures about the universe, she told me, Sayyid, what's special about us human beings in this universe? Are we really that important? Look at what's out there. My dear brothers and sisters, the most honorable creation Allah has created is you, the human being. Know your value. Know your value. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدم. Allah says, and I have given karama, honor, dignity to the children of Adam. I favored them over a lot of the creations that I have created. Don't listen to these atheists. The atheists, they tell you you're just some evolutionary accident. That's all you are. You think you have a purpose? You're just some accident. Allah says, you're the best creation that I have created. I've given you the intellect. Don't underestimate yourself when you have Allah and you know that He's chosen each one of you for a purpose. Society is what distracts us. And don't let anyone take Allah away from you, my dear brothers and sisters. If your house is robbed, your car is robbed, your belongings, your iPhone, it can be replaced. If someone robs you from your Creator, from the connection with your Creator, what, what are you going to replace it with? Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam states, Ilahi, ma'adha wajada man faqadak. Oh Allah, look at the words of the Imam. They truly open your heart. Oh Allah, what has he found? The one who's lost you. You've got the world, got all the riches, but you've lost your connection with Allah. What do you have? What do you have? وَمَاذَا فَقَدَ مَنْ وَجَدَكِ And oh Allah, what has he lost, the one who's found you? If you have Allah, what have you lost? Don't let anyone take it. Not a friend, not a family member, not your social media. Never let anyone take you away from Allah. But we go through these trials every day. Once a dear brother who's a convert, a revert to Islam in Toronto, Canada, he shared with me his story. He told me, Sayyid, you know how I became Muslim? Because I asked him, you know, how, how did you become Muslim? He was like, I used to work at a bar in Toronto. He says, one day, one night, a girl comes to the bar. I get to know her. Then we have a connection. And later I marry her. She turns out to be a Muslim. SubhanAllah, Muslim going to the bar. She goes to the bar, she gets to know him. He's like, she never would discuss Islam with me, never. She comes from a Muslim family background, but she would never discuss religion with me. He says, one day I became curious. I told her, you, your parents are Muslim, you, you're Muslim, right? She's like, yeah. I'm like, how, how come you never talk about Islam? It's like, yeah, it's not important, who cares? 
He's like, no, I'd like to know about it. I mean, I married you, you're my wife, I'm interested in your religion. He told me, Sayyid, I started to do my research and research until I found this to be the most beautiful religion and I converted to Islam. And then he says the following, he's like, Sayyid, when I converted to Islam, my wife became upset. I started praying, I stopped drinking. She told me, come on, what's the matter with you? I married you to have fun. To get drunk with you, to dance. Now you're telling me this halal, this haram, this halal, this haram. He's like, she really started to give me a hard time. He's like, until one, and I struggled. He's like, I struggled. I didn't know what to do. There was just no way to, you know, have an understanding with her. She wanted me to stop praying. Subhanallah, she is the Muslim, so-called Muslim who went. And through her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him. Allah works in mysterious ways, subhanallah. How Allah delivers guidance in, in the least expected ways. Now she's trying to stop him from practicing Islam. I told him, so what ended up happening? He's like, Sayyid, one day she gave me an ultimatum. She told me, look, I will say this to you. Either you choose God or you choose me. You can't have us both. Nastajiru billah. Now I know you're shocked at what she said, right? But my dear brothers and sisters, all of us go through such moments in our life. When we make ourselves choose between God and something else, or we make our family member, husband, wife, parent, child, sibling, friend, to choose between God or us. We may not say it like this, because it's very shocking to say it like this, but we all go through this trial. He's like, when she said that to me, I was so hurt. It's, it's hard. I have a family. I have a child. What am I going to do? I told her, look, I will never choose anything over Allah. I'll, choose ne I'll never choose anything over God. You want to leave? Leave. Fortunately, it didn't work out. She left. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compensated him. Allah gave him a better family. Don't let anyone take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from you. That's what we learn, my dear brothers and sisters, from Abi Abdullah al Hussein on such a night. On every one of these nights, he left because he was driven by the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ilahi taraktul khalqa turran fi hawaka. He says, Oh Allah, I've left. I've left this dunya, this creation, everything. Why? Because of your love, because of your path. Oh Allah, I'm even orphaning my children just to meet you. Oh Allah, if I'm cut into pieces by your love because of your love, my heart will not, will not move an iota from you. These are the words of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. But what kind of a sacrifice did Imam al Hussein السلام, have to make. Tonight is a very heavy night. Tonight we commemorate Ali al Akbar. You know who Ali al Akbar is? One day a Christian man comes to Medina. He had seen the Prophet in his dream. So he wanted to meet a family member of the Prophet to discuss Islam and to become Muslim. So they told him Imam Hussein is here in Medina. He's the grandson of the Prophet. The Prophet is not here. He passed away long ago, but his grandson is here if you want to see him. He goes to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He tells him, I saw your grandfather in my dream. And he invited me to explore the religion of Islam. Teach me Islam. Imam Hussein alayhi salam asked him a very difficult question. The Imam told him, Do you remember how the Prophet looked in your dream? He said, yes, I can vividly see him. I can vividly see it in my mind right now. Imam al Hussein salam tells him, do you want to see an exact copy of Rasulullah? He's like, yes, I wish, I would love to. At that point, Imam Hussein called on his son, my son Ali, Ali come. Ali in al Akbar comes to the masjid, he stands before this Christian man. Imam al Hussein tells him, look at my son, look at this man. Does he look like Rasulullah? The man, when he sees Ali in al Akbar, he breaks into tears. He almost falls unconscious. He says, I swear by God, he looks like a copy of the Prophet that I saw in my dream. 
Imam Hussein السلام, tells him, oh man, if you had a son like him and he would get hurt, what would happen to you? He told him, if I had a son like that, if a thorn would hurt him, my heart would be cut into pieces. Imam al Hussein told him, one day I will see my son cut into pieces. On the day of Ashura, when Ali ibn al Akbar comes and he seeks permission from his father to go and fight, you know what Imam Hussein says in his dua? Up until that moment, the Imam was always patient. But in that moment, the Imam releases his frustration. He says, Allahumma innaka ta'lamu annahu qad kharaja ilayhim ghulamun ashbahu nasi khalqan wa khulqan wa mantqan bi rasulik. He says, oh Allah, you know, now a young man has come forward to them. He is the one who resembles your Prophet most in his speech, in his even looks. Oh Allah, whenever we would miss Rasulullah, we would look at his face. Oh Allah, look at what they're doing to the progeny of Al Muhammad. Look at what they're doing to my son. At that point, Ali and Al-Akbar, with so much courage, he goes out to the battlefield. He fights like a warrior. Now his mother Layla, according to one report, she's not directly seeing the battlefield because they were in an enclosed area, the tents of the women and the children. But she's looking at the face of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein is standing and he's watching his son fight. And the mother of Ali and Al-Akbar, Layla, she's looking at the facial expressions of Imam Hussein. She saw Imam Hussein alayhi salam, his face was illuminated. It was luminous. The Imam was proud, so she knew Ali and Al-Akbar was truly defending the Ahl al-Bayt in the best manner. But then suddenly Layla sees the face of Imam Hussein change. The Imam becomes concerned. She comes to her husband, Aba Abdullah. Did something happen to my son? Allahu Akbar, Imam al Hussein tells her, Layla, the dua of the mother is mustajab. <laughs> Layla, we want to see Ali al Akbar one more time. <laughs> Please go back to the tent and ask Allah to send back Ali one more time. <laughs> you, can, you, you just cannot give up Ali al Akbar when he looks exactly like Rasulullah. She goes inside her tent. She goes inside her tent. She removes her veil and she raises her hand in dua. You know what she says? Ilahi bi'atash al Hussein. Ilahi bi'ghurbati abi Abdullah. Oh Allah, by the thirst of Hussein. By the ghurba, the loneliness of Hussein. Ya radda Yusuf ala Yaqub. Oh, the one who sent back Yusuf to his father Yaqub. Ruddali waladi Ali. Send back Ali one more time to me. She makes this very heartbreaking dua, but at this point she's also thirsty. She's in deep pain. She was dysfunctional at this point. She's like half asleep at this point. She's so tired. She makes this dua moments later. Allah gives victory to Ali and Al Akbar. He rushes back to the tents. He greets his father. The first thing that he says to his father, Aba Aba al Atashu Kat Katalani. My dear father, thirst is killing me. You know, for a long time I thought, Ali and Al Akbar, why does he say that to his father? Ali and Al Akbar does not want to add pain to his father. He knows his father is thirstier than him. Why do you say that to your father? He said that to Imam Hussein so he can prepare his father for his martyrdom. 
So you can tell him, Father, I'm dying from thirst. So when you see me soon being martyred, I will be relieved. Don't worry about me. It was his way of preparing his father. Imam Hussein tells him, my dear son Ali, go to your mother. She wants to see you for the last time. He enters the tent. He sees her almost unconscious. He carries her head in his lap and one of his tears fall on her face. She wakes up. She says, Ali, is that you? <laughs> yes, my mother. I have come to farewell you for the last time. She tells him, my dear son Ali, I have a request from you. Can you stand here in the tent? <laughs> he stands. She begins to examine him. She looks at him. She tells him, Ali, can you walk? <laughs> This is the last time that I will see you, my dear beloved Ali. His heart is broken now. He farewells his mother, O oh, believers. He farewells his father for the last time. He goes out to the battlefield carrying his armor, his sword. And Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali. Nahnu wa baytillah awla bin Nabi. Ahmi iyalati abi amzi ala din al Nabi. But these were the final moments, O oh believers. The enemies, they say, if we let him come into combat one by one, he will finish us all. Let's surround him from every direction. Those cowards, they come, they surround Ali in Al Akbar. One group, they strike him with the stones and rocks. Another group, they strike him with the arrows. How much can he handle? Oh believers, then finally one of those enemies, he strikes Ali in Al-Akbar, he deals a fatal blow to him. Ali in Al-Akbar collapses on the head of his horse, the blood is now gushing. The horse cannot see instead of taking him back towards Imam Hussein. The horse goes towards the enemies. They're waiting like vultures when they see Ali helpless. You know what they do? Each one of them takes out a sword. Oh, Mu'mineen. They strike him. They try to cut him into pieces. He falls to the ground. Aba, Aba, Ya Hussein. عليك من السلام هذا جدي رسول الله Father, remember how thirsty I was. This is my grandfather. He has given me a heavenly cup to drink right now. Father, I shall never go thirsty again. Imam Hussein alayhi salam he rushes to farewell his son Ali in al Akbar. But in what situation that he does he see his son, his beloved beautiful son? He sees him cut into so many pieces. Imam Hussein, the symbol of patience, he says, Bunaya Ali ala dunya You know what that means? My dear son Ali, the world is dark without you. Aba Abdullah, who's a shining star, he says, The world after you is worthless, O Ali. Amma anta faqad istarahta min ammid dunya wa ghammiha. As for you, O Ali, you're now relieved from the misery of this world. Wa baqiya abu kalhammiha wa ghammiha. But your father, your father Hussein, he remains in this world to experience this misery. Allahu Akbar. The narrator says, we saw Hussein, we were wondering, was he, what is he going to do? The Imam, he tried to carry the body of Ali. Oh believers, the Imam carries this side of the body, the other side falls to the ground. He was cut into so many pieces. Then the Imam, he called on the youth of Bani Hashim. Jawanan Bani Hashim. The Imam called them. He says, O oh Bani Hashim, I swear by Allah, La taqatali ala hamli waladi. I don't have the strength or the energy or the capacity to carry the dismembered body of my son Ali. Please help me. 
الله أكبر إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين برای سلامتی آسد من مبداغر غزوینی سلوات جلیل محبت بفرمایی بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا رحمن يا رحيم يا يا سيدي ومولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ومولاي يا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم صادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما يا سلوات محبت فرد اگر چیزی دست من و شما میگیره این سلوات بر محمد آل محمده امیدوارم به آبروی آقا ابا عبدالله به علی اکبر امام حسین امشب همه شما حاجتمن از این در برید بیرون سوم سلوات جلیل تر محبت بفرمایید سوی دشت کربلا شاه شهیدان می رود بر سبیل دین حق و عشق ایمان می رود 
میشه کفت لالن در جای جای کربلا چون به خاک و تربتش خون جوانان می دست عباسش جدا استن به دندان مشک آ رو به سوی خیمه ها سقای عدشان می کس نمی پرسد که این ماه بنی هاشم چرا در طلوع بدر خود از دید پنهان می روید زینب زاری مکن اشکت بپوش از اکبرم الودا اشگو که اکنون او به میدان می روید جز به سجد نافتاد آقا حسین اینک ببین سوی نعش اکبرش افتان و خیزان می روید از غرشش ماه اشخون در گلو شد جای آب خنده اش را بین که بر جنگ حریفان می روید آقا جون شرمنده اگه حق شما رو این روزها ادا نکردم آقا شرمندم اگر این شبها برات خوب گریه نکردم برات خوب ناله نزدم آقا شرمندم اگر دلم به جز در خونت به جای دیگری رفته شرمندم خیلی دل تو شکستم مولا مولا اگه نمک نشناسی کردم به خدا شرمندم حسین جان میخوام به شما بگم یبن الحسن میخوام به شما بگم یا زهرا میخوام به شما بگم اگه تا به قیامت عذابم کنی از آن به که یک دم جوابم کنی از اون شبی که آب و میبندن انگار اتش آدم بیشتر میشه اتش دلش برا گریه کردن بیشتر میشه همه آرزویم همین است و بس مرا نوکر خود خطابم کنی بر من لباس نوکریم را کفن کنی نوکر بهشتم که بره باز نوکره همچین که اومد گفت بابا اجازه بده برم میدان فرمود برو علی جانم اما قبل رفتنت برو تو خیمه با خواهرات و امد ودا کن اومد تو خیمه زینب خواهراش دورشو گرفتن هی hey, میگه امه قربونت بره مبازه به خودت باش عزیز دلم خواهراش دورشو گرفتن سکینه میگه مراقب خودت باش داداش جان یه دختر سه ساله میگه داداش نکنه ما رو تو این بیابون تنها بذاری آماده شو از زیر قرآن ردش کردن همچین که سوار شد اومد بره یه هدی دبا عبدالله صدا زد پسرم صبر کن فرمود بله بابا گفت بیا پایین کارت دارم آمد پایین گفت چند قدم جلو من را برو خوب قد و بالا تو ببینم علی جونم آخه جوون دارا پسر دارا امشب چه خبره کربلایی تا نظر بر قد و بالای رسایت کرده سوختم از دل پردت 
دایت کردم علی اکبر جنگ نمایانی کرد جگرش داره می سوزه برگش خیمه جلوی خیمه صدا زد بابا جگرم داره می سوزه ابی عبدالله زبان خوشگش و بیرون آورد یعنی بابا من از تو هم تشنه ترم دوباره رفت تو دل میدون جنگید با همه جنگش فرق میکنه علی اکبر دیدن دیگه نمیتونن حریفش بشن مثل باباش حسینه مثل پدر بزرگش علیه مثل اموش امام حسنه مثل اموش اول فضله دلاور شجاعه زد تو دل دشمن همونجا کوچه باز کردن حاج آقا فرمودن من امشب آروم میگم ببینم کیه که میتونه جلو خودشو نگه داره همچی که زد تو دل نشمن یه نانجیب شمشیر به فرقش زد یکی نیزه به پهلوش زد این اسب جنگ دیده از تعلیم دیده میدونه وقتی سوار دزش و دور گردن بندازه یعنی باید برگرده به سمت خیمه ها همچین که دزش انداخ دور گردن اقاب خون از سر علی ریخ رو چلو چشم از بگرف عوض این که بره به سمت خیمه رب به سمت دشمن هر کی شمشیرش رو بالا گرفت ای میگو حسین وای پسرم از خیمه میگن ابا عبدالله چنان دوید هی میخورد زمین بلند میشد هی میگو ولدی علی ولدی علی سادات ببخشن گفتن پایین پا تو حرم امام حسین روزه علی اکبر رو نخونید آقا طاقت نداره اما این جمعش گفت پیکرش طوری پراکند از که همش پیدا نمیشه پیکرش طوری پراکند از که همش پیدا نمیشه من نگرونم ما دو تا رو کی به خیمه میرسونه همه از کنیم یا حسین یا حسین برد علی الاکبر نحو المعرک شاهدان شاهران سیفه قائلا انا علی ابن الحسین ابن علی نحن و بیت الله اولا بالنبی تالله لا يحكم بینا تالله لا يحكم فينا ابن الدعي أضربكم بالسيف أحمي عن أبي أطعنكم بالسيف حتى ينثني طعن غلام هاشمي علوي فحمل ثانية وأقبل نحو القوم يضرب فيهم ضربا قويا حتى قتل منهم عددا كثيرا إلى أن جزعوا لكثرة ما قتل منهم عند ذلك مرت ابن منقذ عبدي فما ولى اللعين حتى ضرب على الأكبر علي الأكبر على رأسه فتعلق عليه بالجواد فجال بالفرس من بين الجيش إلى أن قطعه بالسفي إلى أن قطعه بالسيف إربان إربان فاستغاث بأبيه مناديا أبا عليك من السلام يا 
أبتا أدركني سمع صوت الحسين أقبل عليه كشف عنه الأعداء جلس عنده قال يا بني لعن الله قوما قتلوك ما أجرهم على الرحمن وعلى انتهاك حرمة الرسول بني بني علي على الدنيا بعدك نافا وكأنما أم علي الأكبر تقول يا ابني يا ابني الدار يم العادي بحزن يا ابني يا ابني خلاص صبري خلاص صبري وصدق ملي يا ابني يا ابني رد تشفك رد تشفك علي قبر يا ابني رد تشفك علي قبر يا ابني ويجازي رضاي ساعات المني يا الأكبر يا الأكبر ويا ريت رخصت دمعي ويا ريت وقس دنياي بغيابك يا ريت ويا ريت قبل موتك ردت موتي ويا ريت مثل ما صار بك يصير بي تركني الموت ما ادري شلون وياك وياك ترفع عودك واشوف العطش وياك عساني مقطع بسيوف وياك ولا ميت ولا ميت يجوبونك الي صلى الله عليك يا ابا عبد الله ايتجد لي السفوت همي برتره ايتجد لي السفوت همي برتره چه قدر سخت بود رفتن پیغمبر ها چه قدر سخت بود رفتن پیغمبر ها یا علی اکبر یا علی یا علی قد من خم شده تا خوش قد و بالا شده ای قد من خم شده تا خوش قد و بالا شده ای به خدا عشق پدر نیست کم از مادرها یا علی اکبر يا علي أكبر أي تجدني السفوت همي برترها أي تجدني السفوت همي برترها چه قدر سخت بود رفتن پیغمبرها يا علي أكبر اکبر از پیشم خرامان می رود اندک اندک از تنم جان می رود 
اکبرم از پیشم خرامان می رود اندک اندک از تنم جان می رود سر من سر رسته بود و باز شد احتزارم ای خدا آقا شد ای علی جانم جان جانانم ای علی جانم چون علی جان من و روح من است او به دریای بلا نوح من است سهم آبش را به تفلان داد و رفت تشنگان, خی... تشنگان خیمه را جان داد و رفت رفت تبه دشنه که گیرد جان خست رفت لبه تشنه که گیرد جان خست تشنه خونش کمان داران خست قدری اندر معرک جولان نمود پشت ایجاد از تن عدوان نمود ای علی جانم جان جانانم ای علی از اتش در رد چون بیتاب گشت چشم او خیره به سوی آب گشت لیک در حسر سباران بود آب اکبرم را قیمت جان بود آب آمد از میدان تمنا آب کرد از خجالت قلب بابا آب کرد گفت ای بابا اتش جانم گرفت قدرت شمشیر و جولانم گرفت ای علی جانم جان ای علی جانم گر مرا سیراب سازی شاکرم بر اتش دیگر نشد تا باورم کن مرا سیراب از یک جرع آب خسم من حتی از نور آفتاب گفتمش پیشای تو آرام جان در دهان خشک من بن ما زبان از اتش بین هم به سختی زنده ام از اتش بین هم به سختی زنده ام بله از رویت علی شرمنده ام بله از رویت علی شرمنده ام ای علی جانم ای علی جانم زد زبان چون در دهان من گذاشت داغ جان سوزی به جان من گذاشت ای پدر زین قصه راحت می شوی چون هما گوش شهادت می شوی جان من بر دست زهرا بوس زن جان من بر دست زهرا بوس زن شاد دست مرتزا را بوس زن کرد از حالی علی از در صدا کرد از حال علی از در سؤال کرد یادی تلخ از آن برگشت حال ای علی جانم ای علی جانم جان من بر دست زهرا بوس زن شاد دست مرتزا را بوس زن کرد از حال علی از قرص و آر کرد یادی تلخزان برگشت ها رفت تنها سوی میدان لیک من دست می شستم زجان خیشتن بوس زد دستم به میدان رفت و رفت یک و تنها و عدشان رفت و رفت ای علی جانم جان جانانم ای علی جانم جان جانانم ای علی جانم جان جانانم ای علی جانم ای علی جانم ای علی
دمش ها علیه هم یا عمی ها علیه هم میزند فریاد اکبر یا علیه هم این دم و جواب بدین عزیزان عزتون با خود آقا بیا بدان شد ها علیه هم یا عمی ها علیه هم ها علیه هم یا عم ها علیه هم ها علیه هم یا عم ها علیه میزند فریاد اکبر ها علیه ها ها علیه ها یا عم ها علیه ها همه با هم ها علیه ها یا عم ها میزند فریاد اکبر ها علیه ها ها علیه ها یا عم الله الله صاح اکبر بالحرب صاح أكبر بالحروب عمي سبع القنطرة صاح أكبر بالحروب عمي سبع القنطرة أنت صوب الميمنة وأنا صوب الميسرة أنت صوب الميمنة وأنا صوب الميسرة ها عليهم يا عم ها عليهم جانا ها عليهم میزند فریاد اکبر ها علیه ها ها علیه ها علیه ها الله الله لیوت حیدر هل تنخ شمرت ذر عنه لیوت حیدر هل تنخ شمرت ذر عنه شد و اسر و جل اصای من لی و بعنانه هل هلت لی هل معا قامت بتروانه نطوت مزويت عجاج طوشت فرسانه فر اراضي كربلة تصيح بهم يا هلا كل اراضي كربلة تصيح بهم يا هلا ها عليهم يا عم ها عليهم جونا ها جهان نو جهان نو جهان نو جهان غالب هرم پاشد و یک شیر جوان مثل تیری که رها می شود از دست کمان خسته از خسته از خسته از ماندن و آماده رفتن شده بود بعد یک عمره از قفسه تن شده بود مست از کام پدر بود و لبش سوخته بود مست می آمد و روح سار برف روخته بود روح او روح او روح او از همه دل کنده به او دل بسته بر تنش دست ید الله همایل بسته آه علیه ها جان آه علیه ها آه علیه هم الله الله ليلة الوحشة بخزر هل تفيل وتشل تشلت ليلة الوحشة بخزر هل تفيل وتشل تشلت صار ولقاعش لفا أحد جد مزلزلت 
الاحزار والقاعش لفاه احد جد ما تزلزلت زود من سيف ابو فاض زود من سيف ابو فاض زود من الدم دلت يا لي صار الظل حسيح لا لي صار الظل حسيح بزود سيف ترتلت شار برف بغضب راد يقلبها قلب شار برف بغضب راد يقلبها قلب ها عليهم يا عم ها عليهم ها بقوا 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 ها عليهم موسيقى <تصفيق> بعد بعد اقو ها الله الله بيوم طبت للمعار بيوم طبت للمعار بغير غيم مدخني بيوم طبت للمعار بغير غيم مدخني صاحوا اذ بايح نمت بلقوم جدام الحسين سفتحوا ذر الصوار فتلوا فتح المبين سفتحوا ذر الصوار فتلوا فتح المبين على الأكبر من اليسر وأبو فاضل على اليمين على الأكبر على اليسر وأبو فاضل على اليمين فمثل حمزة وحيدرة تعالوا سبع القنطرة فمثل حمزة وحيدرة تعالوا سبع القنطرة ها عليهم يا عم ها عليهم ها عليهم يا عم ها عليهم صاحبيهم أكبر صاحبيهم ها عليهم خودان شیر جوان بی ایچارخی بی آمان بی آمان بی آمان دور خودان شیر جوان بی ایچارخی شیر پایش همه ی مکان بی ایچارخی بارها از دل شم بکن بیرون آمد بارها از دل شم بکن بیرون آمد رفت از می سر از بیرون آمد آن طرف آن طرف آن طرف مهوت ما شعل علی حضرت ما گفت لا حول ولا قوت الا بالله گفت لا حول ولا قوت الا بالله ها علیهم یا عم ها علیهم ها علیهم الله الله ظلت العجه الحريم والشمس كنها اختفت ظلت بعجه الحريم والشمس كنها اختفت على الاكبر من اليسر وسط الحومة شفت على الاكبر من اليسر وسط الحومة شفت لنها ضربات الغضن على هناك مشاق وفت لنها ضربات الغضن على هناك مشاق وفت من شقف سيافة تعجب شاف حمها من التفت من شقف سيافة تعجب شاف حمها من التفت دقوا والظهر بظهر على الأكبر والقمر دقوا والظهر بظهر على الأكبر والقمر ها عليهم يا عم ها عليهم 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 ها عليهم
یا به هم دیگه مونده زود تمام شد دیگه علی مست از کاوم پدر زاده ی لیلا و مجنون مست از کاوم پدر زاده ی لیلا و مجنون مست از کاوم پدر زاده ی لیلا و مجنون به تماشا و یه جنون همه دنیا و مجنون رفتی از رفتی از رفتی از خیش که از خیش به وحدت برسی پسرم چند قدم مانده به به ست برسی نفس نیزه و شم چی روز پربند آمد نفس نیزه و شم چی روز پربند آمد به تماشا اوی نبرد تو خداوند آمد به تماشا اوی نبرد تو خداوند با همان حک که بر آن خدا جان من است با همان حک که بر آن خدا جان من است آی در آی رجز آی تو بر آن من است آی در آی رجز آی تو بر آن من است آله هم یا عم آله هم همه چا خورشیدی که آید به سر بالین ما بر سر, بر سر نعشی علی آمد از خیمه گاه شاه آمد شاه آمد در کنار کشته اکبر ولی دیده اش گریان لبش تشنان دیده اش گریان لبش اتشان دلش پرسوز و آسین لحظه ای حیرت زده در جسم اکبر خیر شد لحظه ای حیرت زده بر جسم اکبر خیر شد ناگهان شد رود در چشمان شاهد شمسی لحظه ای اما برابر با هزاران سال قد لحظه ای اما برابر با هزاران سال غم با تعجب بر سر خالین او استاد شاد چشم یعقوب از غم هجران یوسف دیره شد چشم یعقوب از غم هجران یوسف دیره شد دشمنانش چون که افتندد یوسف را به چار من نمیدانم که این یعقوب دشت کربلا با چه حالی یوسفش را غرق خوندیده الا چون حسین آمد کرا به کشته فرزند خیش در جهان پیچید آبای و بای با زبان حال می گفتش که آیا این تویی کاش می بود آنچه می بینم خدا یا اشتباه سنجانم و سنجان سنجانم و سنجان
حسن جانم حسن جان جانم حسن جان خط آخره حسن جانم حسن جان رخ به رخ علی بن هادا از جان میگری رخ به رخ علی بن هادا از جان میگری کی علی کی علی بعد از تو دیگر حال دون یا شد تبا سنجان حسن جانم حسن جان حسن جانم حسن جان گفته ای تازه جوان اکبر مه پیکر من عزیزان اول سینه نزنید انشالله تکرار بکنین یک دست که شدین بعد سینه میزنید گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر مه پیکر من نو جوان اکبر من نو جوان اکبر همه با هم گفت ای تازه جوان فقط تکرار کن اکبر مه پیکر من گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر مه پیکر من نو جوان اکبر من نو جوان اکبر من گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر مه پیکر من گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر مه پیکر من نو جوان اکبر من نو جوان اکبر من گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر مه پیکر نمیگی گفت ای تازه جوان نو جوان اکبر من نو یه بار دیگه من گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر مه پیکر علی گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر مه پیکر نو جوان اکبر به خودش آمد و فهمید که چشمش تر بود دو قدم منده به بالای علی اکبر بود تازه فهمید چه روزی به سرش آمده است یا که بهتر چه به روز به سرش آمده است پسر دست گلش را چو گل پر پردی هر کجا را او که نظر کرد علی اکبر دی هر کجا را او که نظر کرد علی اکبر دی مثل مه پاره ای افتاده به خاکست تو تنش در همامی تخون و بدنش بیروهنش نو جوان اکبر من نو جوان اکبر گفت ای توز جوان اکبر مه بیکر گفت ای توز جوان اکبر من بیکر من نو جوان دشت من دست تو سواری که زمین گیر شده به تن سد چاک پسد دیده پدر گیر شده ناله اش بین کف و هل هل ها گم شده بود همه گفتن رکوع از بس خم شده بود پسری مانده به خاک و پدری می نگرد مانده حیران که چگونه بدنش را ببرد خوب شد خوب شد بار دگر بوس از آن لب نگذاشت بر نمی مر بر آن بوس که زینب نگذاشت نو جوان اکبر من علی گفت ای تاز جوان اکبر من پیکر جان گفت ای تاز جوان اکبر من پیکر من نو جوان اکبر من زخها با تو چه کردن جوان تر شده ای به خدا بیشتر از پیش پیم بر شده ای پدرت آمده در سین تلا تو مدارد از لبت از لبت از لبت خواهش یک جرعه تبسم دارد 
گوش کن زینبم از سمت هرم می آید با فقان پسرم با پسرم می آید نو جوان اکبر من اکبر من گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر من پیکر من گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر من پیکر من نو جوان اکبر من باز هم عطر گل یاس به گیسو داری ولی این بار چرا دست به پهلو داری کربلا 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 کوچه ندارد همه جایش دشت است یاس در یاس مگر مادر من برگشت است مانده ام پیره به جسمت که چراهی دارم باید انگار تو را بین عبا بگذارم باید انگار تو را بین عبایم ببرم تا که شش گوش شود با تو زری هم پسرم نوجوان اکبر من نوجوان اکبر من گفت ای تازه جان اکبر من جان گفت ای تازه جان اکبر من پیکر نوجوان یه بار دیگه اکبر من گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر من پیکره گفت ای تازه جوان اکبر من حسین 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 دهید کربلا حسین دهید نین ابا حسین شهید نین ابا حسین شهید نین ابا حسین ابد والله يا زهرا ما ننسى حسينا ابد والله يا زهرا ما ننسى ابد والله يا زهرا ما ننسى حسينا ابد والله يا ابد والله يا زهرا ما ننسى حسينا ابد والله يا زهرا ما ننسى حسينا حسين 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 السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء بنت رسول الله السلام عليك يا زينب الكبرى بنت أمير المؤمنين 
السلام عليك يا أبا الفضل العباس يا ابن أمير المؤمنين السلام عليكم يا أهل بيت النبوة ومعدن الرسالة جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت خلوبنا على دينك وعلى محبة الحسين عليه السلام اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات اللهم اشف مرضانا وارحم موتانا اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم ارحمنا برحمتك اللهم زدنا علما وايمانا اللهم زدنا حبا للحسين وال الحسين اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يدي اللهم اغفر لوالدينا وارحم المسلمين والمسلمات اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد خدا بندا بعزت و جلالت این غلیل تبسل از همه ما به نحو احسن قبول بفرما بار پروردگار اسامی ما رو در دفتر زاکرین آقا با عبدالله ثبت و زب بفرما خدایا در دنیا زیارت همه محسومی و در آخرت شفاعت همه آنها نصیب ما بگردار فرج نازنین آقا امام زمان تعجیل بفرما قلب نازنین محبوب آقا رو از همه ما راضی و خوشنود بگردار بار پروردگار آقابت همه ما را ختم به خیر بگردان به عزت و جلالت تا ما را منی آمرزی از دار فانی به دار باقی مبد اخلاق حسینی و عبل فضنی و همه ما عطا بفرما به عزت و جلالت قسمت می دهیم حاجت حاجت مندان برابرده به خیر بگردان بیماران جهان بیماران اسلام همه عزیزانی که التماس دعا گفتن به عزت و جلالت لباس عافیت برقامت همه آنها بپوشان خدایا هر آنچه گفتیم و نگفتیم و بدون محتاجیم به نحو احسن برابرده به خیر بگردان الله وی از کیو to enhance, to enhance our faith into you, Ya Allah. Allahumma Ya Allah, grant us the best guidance in this life. O oh Allah, grant us and grant our youngsters to your guidance, inshaAllah. O oh Allah, enhance our faith into you and our religion. O oh Allah, hasten the reappearance of our Imam. We're going to recite this dua for the Faraj of our Imam, inshaAllah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ilahi azm al-Balag. وبرح الخفاء وانكشف الغطاء وانقطع الرجاء وضاقت الأرض ومرعت السماء وأنت المستعان وإليك المشتكى وعليك المعول في الشدة والرخاء اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وللأمر الذين فرضت علينا طاعتهم وعرفتنا بذلك منزلتهم ففرج عنا بحقهم فرجا عاجلا 
قريبا كلمح البصر أو هو أقرب يا محمد يا علي يا علي يا محمد اكفياني فإنكما كافيان وانصراني فإنكما ناصران يا مولانا يا صاحب الزمان الغاوث 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 أدركني 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 الساعة 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 العجل 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 يا أرحم الراحمين بحق محمد وآل الطاهرين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك حجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة مع الصلوات